So, Sarah, even though Ravens legend Terrell Suggs hasn't officially retired from the NFL, despite being out of the league since 2019, technically February 2020, uh, he's still got plenty of cachet in Baltimore, and deservingly so. And so much cachet that T. Sizzle was seemingly given permission by none other than team owner Steve Bashotti to deny David Ajabo's request to switch his jersey to number 55. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside my co-host Sarah Ellison. It is Thursday, May 18th, and this is your morning Ravens update from Inside the Vault. Presented by our monthly patron title sponsor, GameDayMindset.com, a local to Pasadena, Maryland sports apparel company. Roquan Smith is not so easily impressed with what he calls paper champs. I'll explain what that means a little later on, and I'll also give you Mike McDonald's reaction to Roquan and Marlon Humphrey being at voluntary football schools and Eric DeCosta's reaction to Lamar Jackson not being there. Plus, hold your horses if you thought Marcus Peters to the Raiders was a done deal. We have all of that and more coming up. Thanks for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news in about 15 minutes. All right, Bobby, second year outside linebacker David Ojabo. <laughs> He raised some eyebrows and got some laughs during his press conference Wednesday. And former Ravens legend Terrell Suggs was the main reason as to why. Oh, you bet he was. And I actually thought this was hilarious. I'm with you. You know, Ajabo was asked if he has any plans of switching back to his jersey number he wore while at Michigan, which of course was 55. The same number that T. Sizzle wore during his 16-year career in Baltimore. Suggs not letting me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask? Yeah, you yeah, asked? we had discussions, man. Uh, you know, it got Bashadi involved a little bit, but <laughs> look, 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 that's that's above me. He's a legend, uh, so I'm gonna stick with 90. You know, but you tried. I tried. I had to try. I had to try. I had to try, but nah, he awesome. not going for it. So again. Even though he has yet to formally retire from the NFL, despite being out of the league since February 2020, this is probably a good indication that the Ravens eventually plan on hanging that number 55 up in the Ring of Honor, high atop M&T Bank Stadium, to be forever immortalized in Baltimore. But Sarah, in order for that to happen, he's got to technically retire. So what's he waiting for? That is a great question that I wish I had an answer to. I don't think anybody has that answer except for T. Sizzle. Bobby, it's been three years. But I will say this, regardless of when he does make it official, I'm personally not worried about it pushing back his potential bid for a Hall of Fame induction. My guess is his five-year wait for that Hall of Fame eligibility that will start from his last game played. So there was more to the press conference aside from the Terrell Suggs conversation. So being that Ajabo's rookie season was essentially lost in the aftermath of his Achilles tear that he sustained during his March, what, 2022 pro day while at Michigan. Uh, this is truly his first legitimate NFL offseason from an availability standpoint. And that's something defensive coordinator Mike McDonald highlighted on Wednesday. First thing is, is he has a, a full year of, of the of the program, you know, to, to physically get himself, you know, to a spot. I was actually talking to somebody out there today. I mean, he looks great. I um, feel like he's put on some good weight, you know, and um, looks stronger and uh, looks fast right now. And I think, you know, more than anything, mentally, I think he's in a great spot as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of confidence from him, you know, throughout the process. That's, that's great to see him in good spirits. Ajabo also shared with reporters that he's added a solid 10 pounds of what he says is all muscle. And it's coming back after his injury, which puts him around 255 pounds overall. And his running mate and former high school teammate, Odafe Owe, he spoke about what the duo hopes to accomplish together on the field this fall. We just want to show like Baltimore a different thing that you know they haven't seen necessarily, but you know we know that there's there's, there's a real opportunity right here, um, a real great story coming from like where we both come from, being together, starting football late, you know, soaring and you know having trials, tribulations, you know, beating that. So we know the opportunity that we have. You know, we just want to we want to be those guys for Baltimore. You know, you know, it is pretty remarkable that these two first came across one another while attending Blair Academy in New Jersey. Remember, Ajaba was born in Nigeria and then raised in Scotland. Owe, he's also of 
Nigerian descent as well, but he was born in New Jersey. And as he put it, he didn't start playing organized football until 11th grade. So, so many similarities between the two. Late bloomers, uh, the Nigerian background. They're a pretty freaking incredible story, which isn't lost on a Jabo in the slightest. Honestly, I see it as a brotherhood at this point. You know, we, we lived in the same dorm in, in high school. You know, he went off to Penn State, Michigan, and now, you know, we're about to be playing across from each other. Man, it's just everything to me, you know, just, you know, make me feel more, you know, at home, you know, feel, feel the love and, you know, support, especially through my injury. And Sarah, back to football for a second. I think an argument can absolutely be made that there isn't another player on this roster with more pressure and expectation surrounding him than Adafe Owe as he gears up for year three all of a sudden we blinked. As he acknowledged during his press conference, he's been so close so many times when it comes to getting to the quarterback, especially last year. And hey, while I understand that pass rushers aren't just graded on sack production, I also know he hasn't finished enough plays like a first round pick is expected to, especially in Baltimore. I do not think it's a hyperbole to say that 2023 is a make or break year for OA. I don't know, Bobby, I'd say Lamar has quite a bit of pressure, but I get your point. And by the way, Wednesday marked Ajabo's 23rd birthday. He is a year 2000 baby, so happy birthday to him. And still to come here on The Vault, I got stuff on Roquan Smith, Marlon Humphrey, and Lamar Jackson. So stay tuned. Sarah and I are super excited to announce our new sponsor, Oakley. Express your style and build a look that's made for you. And I know for me, I have super sun-sensitive blue eyes. So not only does Oakley check my fashion box, but it checks my necessity box. Oakley's changing the game, and it's time to discover a whole new world of possibilities. Maybe you run. Maybe you golf. Maybe you just flat-out train. I don't know. Maybe you just want to look like Lamar Action Jackson. If any of those are true, you need to get yourself a pair of Oakley's today. Suited for everyday eyewear with frames and lenses allowing for an extension of self. Really, it's an expression of your personality. There's more than meets the eye. And here on The Vault, we're all about look good, feel good, perform good. And that's why Oakley is the perfect partner for us. We do not leave the house in the morning without rocking our Oakleys. And hey, since it's officially almost summer, you may want to upgrade your sunglasses game right now. Check out Oakley.com to get yourself a pair today. I know my go-to sunglasses are the custom frog skins, so maybe take an extra look at them while you're there. Oakley even offers Prism Lens Technology, which is a proprietary technology to Oakley and available for everyday settings as well. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to Oakley.com and do your own research. And while you're there, get yourself a pair of everyday glasses that'll be sure to change your look for the better. When you wear Oakley, there really is more than meets the eye, but don't just trust me. Try for yourself. I've worn a lot of sunglasses brands in my life. I know Sarah has as well. We feel like we can both confidently say that Oakley's not only the best looking, but the best quality out there. So head on over to Oakley.com for more information today. So Sarah, the Ravens have made plenty of off-season moves that turned a once angry fan base into one that's now so hype that September cannot even come soon enough at this point. Now, signing Lamar Jackson, Odell Beckham Jr., and drafting Zay Flowers in the first round uh, will certainly have that kind of effect. It certainly will. And, Bobby, it's had that effect on us, but not everyone is so easily impressed. Defensive leader Roquan Smith, he was asked about the new roster additions, and his answer is just perfect. This sound is courtesy of Mass and Orioles. Here we go. Yeah, man, I'm excited about it. You know, that stuff is on paper right now, but I'm more excited once we get out there on the field. You know, we don't want to be any paper champs. Uh, we want the real thing. So I think we're built for it. As long as we uh, we stay healthy and do what we need to do, I think the sky's the limit. I love that answer. We don't want to be paper champs. Bobby, you and I both know this. There is so something about Roquan where it feels like there is so much more to him than meets the eye. He isn't as loud publicly, at least as somebody like Marlon Humphrey, right? He doesn't put himself on social media like that. He's much more reserved. He's not in your face, but there is another side to him that I don't think most fans get to see because he's not looking for that spotlight, but Odafe Owe, he said in Wednesday's pressers that Roquan and Marlon compete 
for being the loudest guys in the locker room. So it's like when it comes to football, you know Roquan flips a switch and just becomes a beast. And I think we got a little taste of it with a quote like we just had. Just imagine these two dudes, as we heard about on draft night, traveling together in Asia. Right? Like these two personalities, it's hilarious. And I really appreciated uh, Roquan for kind of letting us in again on opening night of the draft when he joined us uh, on the vault. But uh, speaking of Roquan and Marlon, both of these guys were at the team's voluntary football school on Wednesday. And Mike McDonald was asked what it means to have the two biggest defensive leaders there and present. I mean, it's huge for us. And it, those are conversations that uh, that we've had with Marlon and guys like Roquan and, and, you know, just encouraging them to kind of take the team by the horns and, and make it their team. And some of the conversations we had last year was, hey, it was great that we hit our stride at some, at fi- at, you know, at some point in the season, but let's, why don't we do that earlier? And uh, having the guys around and building camaraderie and building a team chemistry is, is, a, is a great byproduct of this whole process as well as, you know, improving your individual skills and understanding the scheme and all that type of stuff. But that's really the biggest part, in my opinion, about this kind of a, a stage of the, of, a, of the off season. So it's obviously no surprise that McDonald loves having his two biggest defensive leaders on the field in May that makes McDonald's job and all of his position coaches so much easier but notably I want to point out he's basically saying that in this stage of the offseason program them being there what it provides is mostly camaraderie and then individual skills now that's great and all I'm here for that it's cool that they're there But let's be real about how much of an impact this time of year has on the actual football field. And listen, McDonald kind of undermines his first point that it's huge having them there with this quote a few minutes later. It's hard to run plays on air against ourselves. You see our offense, they're running plays, you know, a million plays a day. Like there's nobody out there to run plays against for us. So we got to work on our skills. It's a great opportunity for us to work our fundamentals and really build our, our, our foundation is really the message right now. So, you know, we move into actually start practicing OTAs and really training camp is kind of the focus right now that we can hit the ground running and we have a solid foundation moving forward. Sarah, when Mike says that his defense is running plays against air, uh, he means that literally. Yeah. Like During this phase of the offseason program, the, the actual rules prohibit the offense and defense from even lining up against one another. So you literally get more out of an in-season walkthrough because at least then these guys can line up against each other. So if you watch videos coming out of practice, you literally just see these guys hitting bags and running against air. I don't want to belittle what Roquan or Marlon are doing by being here, but I just want to put it all in perspective. It feels nice to have him there, but the football impact is minuscule. And it bears mentioning that Roquan, when he was traded here, he said it was actually easy on him because he doesn't have a wife or children that he needs to consider. So it's easier for him to remain in Baltimore during these this offseason program that really doesn't have much football impact. It's easier for him than for somebody like a Lamar Jackson or an Odell Beckham Jr. who both have kids and like to st- stay near those kids for as long as possible because they're living out of the state. And so if they can't even do a seven-on-seven – They can't get those types of reps in in Baltimore. It makes sense for them to do that exact same individual work and even film study from where they are at. And Sarah, speaking of Lamar, he posted a video of himself working out from South Florida to his Instagram page. And it was basically a 15 second story of him throwing a pass in slow-mo. So we do know, yeah, he is getting some work in. And Eric DaCosta was asked point blank a few days ago, about Lamar currently not being at the team's offseason program, even though traditional organized OTAs have yet to actually begin. They begin May 22nd. This has just been two weeks of football school, and then prior to that, it was mandatory uh, rookie mini camp. So anyway, here's what EDC said about that. Our offseason program, Jerry, I think you know this, but maybe not. It's not a mandatory program. Nope. Nope. And so uh, it's up to the player, and we can make our feelings known. Uh, I think Lamar knows we'd like him here, but that's going to be up to the player. And, um, you know, collectively bargained. Some guys are here, some guys are not. Some guys are here for part of the program. Some guys are not here for any of the program. Some guys are here every single day. So uh, I'm not going to have a strong opinion on that right now because it is collectively bargained because players have the rights to do what they want to do. We support Lamar. Uh, we do think it's best for all of our players to be here. We do have a new offensive coordinator. I think it's really, really important that our offense is on the same page. Um, 
And I'm confident that we'll be on the same page by the time September rolls around. And that sound was from the Adam Jones podcast. And Bobby, that quote, it makes me chuckle a little bit because it was the most perfect politically correct answer possible. EDC said exactly what he needed to say. He didn't undermine the coach's program by saying Lamar doesn't need to come. He also didn't undermine the CBA by emphasizing players' rights. And then he didn't even undermine his own franchise quarterback by saying he supports him. EDC literally didn't take his side and good for him. I, however, will take a side. Lamar absolutely does not need to be in Baltimore for football schools, even if Roquan and Marlin are. And we can talk about OTAs once they start next week. That's different. We'll talk about that later. But right now, nobody in Baltimore is installing an offense via individual drills. And whether Lamar is throwing passes in Florida or in Baltimore, he's not throwing to his top targets because they're not in Baltimore either. And I was interacting with a few people on Twitter yesterday, and I'm trying to figure out why people are so fired up about this when it, these these practices are so limited. And, you know, you explain how limited they are. And what I've come to learn by interacting with them is they basically want Lamar to be a cheerleader. That's what they want him to be. Sorry, I don't subscribe to that. You're not paying Lamar $260 million to be a cheerleader. That's what the actual cheerleaders are for. He doesn't need to be there motivating guys like, I don't know what, Tylen Wallace, who might not even be on the 53-man roster in September. These are grown men. They're professionals. Tylen doesn't need Lamar to cheer him on. He needs real reps with him. And that can't start happening until next week. But the real reps where you're actually tackling and going up against people, that real those real reps, those don't begin until training camp in July. All right, Bobby. So earlier this week, we led our show with Marcus Peters official with the Las Vegas Raiders. We need an update. What is going on there? Yeah. So much like we did in Tuesday morning's episode, we'll turn to the athletics Vic Tafer and defer to him. He was asked by a follower of his on Twitter if there was any update on how Peters visit went. Uh, Tafer quote tweeted the following quote. I wouldn't go buying a Peters Raiders jersey just yet, close quote. So make of that what you will. Sounds to me like Juice Man more than likely left Vegas without a deal signed, which doesn't necessarily mean that things are dead in the water. I mean, maybe the Raiders wait until training camp comes around to get something done. I don't know. Right. I mean, you can think about how much time was between Rocky Sin's official visit and his eventual signing in Baltimore. Weeks went by. Now, obviously, a lot of that had to do with con- three, two, one. Now, obviously, a lot of that had to do with compensatory pick, you know, kind of organizational strategy, but the point still stands. Partner, I know you're still pushing hard for a <laughs> Juice Man reunion, but speaking of rock, since you went there, uh, defensive coordinator Mike McDonald spoke uh, on his newest cornerback at his disposal on Wednesday. Yeah, with Rock, I mean, the, the best compliment, he's so he's physical and he, he's such an aggressive player. And uh, just that type of demeanor just fits in great here. And, you know, he looks great out there moving around. So, uh, you know, we're excited to see what he can do and, and, and what he can bring to the table for us. And a couple other notes while we're at it here as well. McDonald was asked about nose tackle Michael Pierce. Remember him? It's been a minute. His 2022 (laughs) came to a screeching halt thanks to a torn biceps after just three games. And as Mike says, the dude was off to a tear. So I'll be looking forward to seeing what he has in store uh, come this fall. And finally, rookies are back at one winning drive. First round selection Zay Flowers was once again seen fielding punts during Wednesday's football school. And Sarah, we have both talked about this, like knowing this dude's quick cutting ability, his explosiveness his lateral quickness, sign me up for that special teams experiment for sure. I don't know what that means for Devin Duvernay, but sign me up and let's get a competition going. And before we fly, some other quick news items, beginning with the fact that veteran pass rusher Justin Houston is still a free agent on the market. But as we know, he probably won't make a decision of which team to join until training camp. Now, remember, Houston has been a mentor and advocate for Odafe Owe ever since he entered the league. So, the question was posed to Odafe. 
does he hope that the vet eventually returns to Baltimore? Hey man, Justin, you know, he's his own man, you know, and he's really driven on what he wants to do. So, you know, I'm hoping, you know, whatever he does is for the best for him. But, you know, we would love to have him back, you know, and everything like that. But, you know, Justin, Justin, I know he's going to make the right decision for himself. And finally, ESPN's fantasy football guru, Field Yates, was talking about how hard it is to evaluate Odell Beckham Jr., obviously from a fantasy standpoint, because it's been so long since he's had an entire full season of production. But then he made a point that I hadn't thought about. Maybe others already have, but we always talk about how OBJ is the best weapon Lamar has ever had. I really think that's still true. Well, Lamar is the best quarterback OBJ has ever had, too. And that combination will be exciting to watch come September. Thanks for listening to The Morning Vault. We created our show to keep you plugged in to all things Ravens. If you've been enjoying our content, please consider joining one of our membership platforms by visiting patreon.com forward slash Ravens Vault podcast. As you probably know by now, we have been betting on ourselves by creating content independently from any big broadcast station or corporation. And with your membership support, You'll give us a chance to keep churning out Daily Ravens content for years to come. And a special shout out to two of our newest patrons, Anis and Joe Bonzel. We appreciate you guys and your support. We'd love to hear from everyone, whether you're a patron or not, with comments, questions, or if you'd be interested in advertising. We also have a mailbag coming up. So you can reach us by email via BaltimoreRavensVault at gmail.com. Get all your questions to us and we will answer them on that next episode. But For now, that is all the time we've got today. We will be back on Friday with the Ravens news you need to know.